This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Working around NGOs and 
decided very good to hear what he has to say. Well, but I've seen Paco as a dog. I'm a person who's not really going to talk more about that, but I mean, I think this issue of uh, the very good book on this by James Boyce on the, the peace, the economy of the peace uh, in 1992, which drew very good attention to the way IMF and Bretton Woods kind of looked at uh, El Salvador after the war and promoted an economic model that took nothing of the issues of peace into account. So it's very interesting that I, what Alvaro de Soto says about everything was structurally just including the peace. I think there was very much an IMF Bretton Woods system approach at that time, and which actually, you know, continues. If you look at Guatemala and what happened in Guatemala, you can see something very, very similar by not taking into account the economy of peace, which meant jobs, opportunities, sense of future for the, the mass of society. Um, what happened in Guatemala is that when the peace accords were put to the population, they voted against them and very few people even voted because the price of electricity had zoomed up. Even though they got access to electricity, they couldn't afford it. So, you know, huge issues around that and huge issues about the lost opportunity of building institutions of the state at a moment when the market dropped, you know, became the driver of development. And that meant in a society recovering from this, you know, incredible civil war, it was very, very difficult to uh, actually find a way of bringing society together for building a peaceful society. Um, again, uh, like Jenny, I do work on climate change, but two issues really spring in mind that I think are really urgent. One is land use and the urbanisation, where building projects are taking place in El Salvador, and the trees have just been put down ad nauseum. The effects of this were very clearly seen in the 2001 earthquake with the landslide. So though you have so-called natural disaster, the man-made effects are very, um, very obvious. Lack of building regulations, etc., 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 all have effects. Um, the second one is food security, which I think has become an issue in recent years. The price of beans, which is obviously a staple for El Salvadorans, has gone up. Um, I think it's employment of beans is over a dollar. Um, which if you think of a family economy, um, you know, um, that is an extreme point of mind. One thing I would say, which brings to the next question, is that survival strategies in vulnerable communities for dealing with some of these disasters, in my impression, like, um, I haven't followed this issue very clearly, but they have improved, particularly post I think 1990 was a big learning um, opportunity. I was working there at the time, which is why I'm um, pointing to that. And so the kind of responses by certain communities to, say, for example, hurricanes, etc., have been much quicker. And that level of civil society organisations very much um, um, allow the communities. And if I'm not mistaken, we're not going to, to say more about this, but I think one of the kind of a um, big issue for the Foodies government has been climate change, and the Minister of and the, the Environment Minister has been um, extremely active. There are other kind of um, civil society activists, I think mean, Ricardo Navarro, who works with SESTA, and he's also on the front there. I know he's been to Scotland a lot, I'm not sure how much he's been to London, but he's certainly, that kind of civil society activism has been very strong. Which takes you to kind of civil society more generally, and women's NGOs, um, which is where my, um, my, my heart is, if you like. Um, I think women's NGOs are still, as Jenny says, extremely strong, particularly around the prevention of violence. One major um, outcome of this has been the promulgation of the integrated law for life free from violence, um, which should come into to, to, to being um, this year. How this is implemented will be another question, because whether the resources are there for that um, will be another question. Women are still working in an extremely challenging environment, but they're demonstrating phenomenal tenacity. Um, I mentioned when I was speaking that I've been doing some work with our some American the Convention of uh, Gender Violence uh, campaign uh, in recent years. And I had a most amazing experience there last year where um, a literate woman who have been working through for years on empowerment issues, on um, learning about women's rights, uh, were at a capacity that's on a training event with judges on the new law. And of course, the kind of 
macho judges were sitting around going, ah, oh, you know, here women are tremendous and making these kind of easy jokes that, um, that, that often come. And this survivor of violence from a low income community on the outskirts of San Salvador stood up, challenged them, and left them all silent. And I think that to me just said so much um, on the IMF. <laughs> um, thank you very much for the very good questions. Um, the first, in terms of um, climate change, instead of trying to say something, um, yes, um, let me say that I think that the, the work of Alfredo Stein in the University of Manchester is extremely important to discuss some of the local responses and how this is, um, has been done. And I would encourage all of you to take a look at. Um, the second is that I do think that um, El Salvador is one of the many places in which debates about climate change, but also about um, natural disasters and how to deal with natural disasters, has to be linked to the debate about economic reconstruction and, and, and what we do, we do with the economy. That you, as long as those two debates take place in a very different uh, places, both institutionally, politically, and uh, Etc. We are really not going to advance because um, it's one of the countries where the two challenges are very much interlinked. The, se the second question was more about social movements. That is, but, but it started with a with a premise about the weakness of the state that I want to challenge a little. Um, and, and if if I at least was uh, one transmitting, I don't think the Salvadorian uh, state in many areas is weak, um, especially when one compares to Guatemala. Um, Aaron Schneider has just published a great book on tax reforms and taxation in um, Central America in which he shows how different elites are constructing different states. The Salvadoran state is a neoliberal state, which does some things relatively well. Um, it does regulation of the financial system relatively well, it has been able to raise more funds, even if not in the ways uh, many of us in um, this room would want. Um, it has um, been able to set an agenda about trade negotiations and where it wanted to take, and it has developed some um, targeted social programs that Guatemala has not even been able to start thinking about. So um, I think it's very important analytically to distinguish between weak states, the states that are no longer doing the things, the minimum things they should be doing because the elite is not interested uh, in maintaining this, Guatemala versus the states that are not doing the things we want them to do, at least some of us, but are still very much very strong. Because they mean we can build much more things, and I think that's what a friend found when you have that state that when you don't have any at all. The last one now about the IMF and the World Bank. Um, the first, I think, is, is the key element of how wrong the IMF and the World Bank were about their understanding of um, reconstruction and peace, not just in El Salvador, but in other parts. Basically, they reproduced the Washington Consensus to context in which obviously their priorities needed to be very, very different. So, for example, even if you are in a liberal and think that public employment is not a very good thing, you have to understand that under reconstruction, it is much more important. Now, was, that, was, was it a key actor? Or was it a driver? I don't think so. I, I think very much um, the Salvadorian elite had a project that um, was independently of the IMF and the World Bank, actually um, the one that wanted to implement. And in some ways, it is actually much more conservative than the IMF and the World Bank. In fact, I think in the 1990s uh, and 2000s, the role of international institutions in Central America has become much more complicated than before. On the one hand, they are pursuing agendas that are very negative, um, CAFTA, etc. would be a good example, but on the other, they have pushed for um, increases in social spending and tax reforms, becoming an actor that is extremely important for social movements in the set of arguments they build around taxation. And I think in many ways, that's a very interesting story where one wants to think about the IMF and the World Bank is, and, and the Inter-American Development Bank, is how much more complex their agenda it is today especially when you think about a very conservative elite that in many ways is much more conservative than the international institutions themselves. Yes, please. I think I've worked for you once or twice. But anyway, I just, um, it's been very interesting presentations and, and I want to address some of the questions that the audience have, 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 have made. I think they're, they're brought 
very interesting things that perhaps um, I could add. First, uh, climate change. Yeah, it is, uh, as, as the panelists have shown, a big, perhaps one of the biggest challenges that we face nowadays. And, you know, certainly our environment minister has been very active in coming to Scotland, coming to here, and trying to to um, nurture himself from from the experience that, that um, the UK has had in that area. Um, so I, I think that one of the big challenges for his um, portfolio is to really try to make climate change and the environment a transgovernmental issue. And that's sort of like where he has been concentrated a lot in, in making climate change or the effects of, uh, of climate change not his whole agenda, but rather also the agenda of the education minister when building schools, uh, the public works minister when he's building roads and infrastructure. So I think he's got a big challenge, but I think he he, he has good intentions in, in doing so. Another aspect of uh, climate change that uh, perhaps you know, people would like also to, to have in mind is that this has become a regional thing. It's not a Salvadoran issue, and as a region we need to find um, a, a way to deal with it collectively. And uh, there's a lot of this uh, going on at the what we call the Central American Development. Um, just want to get it right. Um, Development uh, Commission, which is basically the environment, um, um, ambiente, it's, it's environment and development commission. It's the environment uh, uh, ministers uh, dealing with this issue. They come up with a regional climate change strategy that is. Uh, it's there, it's, it's pretty much alive, uh, and it's uh, open uh, to uh, donor countries that want to match funds with, with that regional strategy. The UK has, has, been, has been working with us on that, on that matter, so I think that's uh, another linkage that is very interesting that I found that uh, it's being worked here in the UK, RUSI, the Royal uh, United uh, Services Institute is working on is the linkage between climate change and security. And uh, we were just very recently at a, at a uh, panel at Bruzi, and there's a lot of people working not only with Central America, there's I think a Mexican <coughs> researcher working, but also seeing the problem as a middle America thing and the linkages with migration also. So uh, that's that's a very interesting that I'm, I'm not a scholar. But certainly, um, scholars are, are working on that problem and linking it with other, other um, important issues um, uh, for us. Civil society, certainly, you know, the current government, pretty much the product of that. Um, when you look at most of the cabinet uh, uh, people, uh, members that are right now in the Finnish government, they come from civil society, and I think that's thanks to the success that civil society, uh, that, that uh, NGOs and civil society organizations had. So I think pretty much what we will see in the ministry is a lot of um, willingness to engage with civil society and NGOs in trying to educate and better prepare um, our public policy making in, in, at, at the government level. Um, certainly this is true for the economic and, and, and social a forum that the Funes administration has been you know, promoting um, uh, at, at the government level. Um, um, the IMF, uh, the World Bank, I think that um, particularly the World Bank and, and the uh, institutions such as the ITB um, and certainly development banks have been very much, very much helping us in developing and giving us funds for the social agenda. There's been a shift into investment more social programs and certainly pretty much we've seen a difference you know in, in the from, from the Washington consensus commitments to supporting us in, in, a, in a broader more um, inclusive agenda of those things that were left you know before in, in, in other in other efforts by this uh, in financial institutions and when it comes to dollar dollarization certainly being a dollarized economy um, needs sort of like the supervision uh, of, uh, of the IMF. And there's been pacts and there's been uh, um, um, agreements that um, uh, so the Alex and Ovia have 
the South African American people here, you know, um, has been dealing with in, in, in what you are dollarized economy, there's a lot of things that you cannot do. But, but certainly, you know, you have to be very mindful of maintaining fiscal discipline, of maintaining um, some budgetary uh, um, uh, balances. And I think those, that's when the IMF has come into place to help us. Thank you. Sorry. No, no. Thank you very much. Uh, in view of the time, I'm going to suggest that those of you who might still have questions, take them up with individual uh, members of the panel during the, uh, the drinks reception to follow. Uh, in, by way of closing, I, I hope you uh, will, will appreciate with me the, uh, really the insightful and rich uh, presentations that we've had on a whole range of, of subjects. Uh, I do want to uh, return our discussion a bit to the spirit of the event, uh, commemorating the 20th anniversary of the 1992 Peace Accords. Uh, I don't want, a, a number of uh, panelists have focused on the continuing very real problems that El Salvador uh, experiences. I wouldn't want to suggest that an American is necessarily more optimistic than the English, the Scots, and the Spanish, uh, but I do think it is important. Irish. Uh, Irish. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but I, uh, some accents still escape me. Uh, but I do, uh, I do want to uh, emphasize the great distance, uh, at least in political terms, that El Salvador has traveled in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, 30 years ago, in 1982, it was virtually inconceivable uh, that El Salvador would be a, a, a country of some degree of political peace, uh, where problems are resolved through the competitive electoral, uh, or at least addressed through the competitive electoral process. Uh, democracy is certainly not a panacea for social or economic problems. It is primarily a mechanism for the resolution of political conflict, uh, and it is to uh, the great credit of El Salvador and parties on both the left and the right uh, that over the last uh, 20 years, uh, a mechanism has been established for the peaceful resolution of policy difference, differences at, at the national level. Uh, the rightist or center-right uh, arena party uh, held sway in El Salvador politics for many, many years, uh, replaced gradually at the municipal and legislative levels uh, by the uh, FMLN, and now since 2009 uh, in the presidency as well. Uh, alter partisan alternation in power is really one of the key tests of democratic consolidation, uh, and that really is something to be applauded in the uh, experience of El Salvador in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, would you please join me in thanking all the members of the panel for their excellent presentations.